Hi, welcome listeners. Um, this is the December episode of the CNS podcast and uh, Journal Club. Um, this time, this month, we'll be discussing uh, uh, an article, a recent article on uh, end, comparing endoscopic with microscopic discectomies and the true cost um, with a kind of an interesting analysis. Um, and we have several guests um, uh, with us today. Um, I, myself, I uh, am a recent graduate from Emory Residency and uh, did an enfolded spine fellowship and am now in private practice at Northside Hospital in Atlanta. And um, we're just going to kind of go, go around here and introduce, uh, let everyone introduce themselves. Uh, Dr. Abdul Abar. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammad Abdabar. I'm a spine surgeon here at uh, Duke University. I've been here for about uh, eight years, and uh, I do th both uh, endoscopic and microscopic uh, uh, spine surgery, and uh, excited about the discussion today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and uh, Siva, would you mind going mm -hmm. next? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Ahilan Siva Ganesan. Uh, I go by Siva. Um, I'm a, a, a neurosurgeon. Um, I spent my first few years in practice at Thomas Jefferson uh, and just now moved down uh, to a new uh, program in Naples, Florida with the Hospital for Special Surgery or HSS. Um, and uh, uh, very thankful for the chance to talk about uh, about this article with all of you. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Vega. Yeah, I'm uh, Rafael Vega here at BIDMC, the uh, co-chair of the uh, CNS Journal Club podcast. Although I don't do spine, I'm very interested in some of these topics, and I look forward to the conversation. Perfect. Um, so let's uh, uh, start with a um, uh, introduction to the article. So if you want to go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, essentially, the sort of summary of this paper was that we wanted to really evaluate at a granular level uh, the cost differences in the operating room between uh, transframinal endoscopic lumbar discectomy and uh, microscopic lumbar discectomy. Um, and I think the big caveat here is that when people talk about cost analyses or cost tracking, um, historically, that has been quite error prone um, because the methodologies usually involve either implant tracking alone or some sort of crude um, estimation based on RVUs or payments to payers and trying to back calculating to true costs from that. And so if you look a lot of, at a lot of the sort of cost literature in the early 2000s and 2010s, there's, if you put it on PubMed and search, there's tens or hundreds of papers, but a lot of them were looking at things like, you know, Medicare allowable rates and sort of back engineering to costs from there. And I had a sort of a, a bit of an epiphany when I came into practice uh, around a methodology called time-driven activity-based costing, um, which is essentially a, a cost-tracking methodology promoted uh, originally from the Harvard Business School, where you essentially create a process map for every step in a care pathway, whether it's in the outpatient setting or in the operating room, and you identify all the material and personnel resources that are being applied to that patient at every step of the, of the process. So in the operating room, that includes everything from implants and disposables to the personnel costs. So for example, if a radiation tech is in the operating room for eight minutes, well, what is your hospital system paying that radiation tech at a dollars per minute basis times eight minutes? You do the same thing for the traveling nurse, for the scrub tech, for the surgeon, for the fellow, for the RNFA. So if you do this arithmetic for all the personnel resources and material resources, and you calculate how much time the patient is spending with each of, the, each of those resources, you can essentially get to an estimate of the true internal cost of a surgery or any phase of care. So we have created a sort of prospective cost registry using this methodology, and we wanted to apply it to this question of endoscopic versus microscopic discectomy. Um, because uh, endoscopy is becoming more and more popular, uh, and yet there is this criticism about, about sort of the expense associated with it. We wanted to tackle that question head on. Um, and that's sort of the motivation for this paper. And sort of the quick, um, maybe one liner summary that we found is that um, when we did an adjusted analysis, looking at all the sort of available confounders that we know affect cost, including who the surgeon was and certain comorbidities and other uh, 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 diagnosis specific factors, we found that with all those adjustments, um, there was no statistical difference in the cost required to execute 
that next endoscopic discectomy versus that next microscopic discectomy. And that's what we mean by marginal cost. Um, so we're not taking into account the upfront cost of buying the endoscopic tower or the microscope or anything. It's like tomorrow you want to do a discectomy. You're trying to decide you have availability for both options and you're trying to decide which one to do. What is the cost difference uh, in that in that point of decision making? Um, so I'll, I'll probably uh, start with that. And um, again, thanks to everyone for, for your interest. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was a good way of framing it. Um, I pulled up while you're talking, I kind of pulled up this figure. Are you able to see it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this sort of, I think, captures some of the pipeline or pathway of the paper and how you kind of broke the costs down into supply costs and personnel costs and then map those onto time based. Um, and we can start with uh, some questions. Dr. Abdel Barr, do you want to lead off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Siva, once again, uh, I always think Siva is one of the smartest people around. I always uh, like to read his papers because then I realize, you know, just how uh, not smart I am. So uh, congratulations <laughs> uh, on uh, another uh, uh, great, great work. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, your paper uh, is an important one. I think that uh, would be uh, fair to say because the surgeon is a very expensive commodity that kind of drowns out and dilutes out, you know, the rest of the cost. Is that a fair uh, assessment? Um, I, I, yeah, I think that's a, that's an important point. Um, yeah. Like the, the, if you look, if you were to rank order the dollars per minute costs of all the resources for a case, the surgeon is sort of way up at the top and everyone else is sort of crowded much lower, in, including, you know, material resources. But the answer, that's a really important point. However, you know, when we've done this sort of TDABC cost tracking analysis, whether it's for discectomies or anything else, there are sometimes 3x or 4x differences in total intraoperative cost for certain types of high volume spine surgeries. Um, so like for one level ACDF, even at the 18 hospital Jefferson Health System, we were seeing some surgeons who were four times more expensive than others. Um, and yeah, some surgeons are getting paid a little more than others, but it's an employed surgeon model. And so there's definitely not a 4X difference in sort of the surgeon pay. So I think there really is some significant drivers of cost variation that get down to things like how many trays are you opening? What kind of implants are you using? Or in something like this, all the disposables that might go into an endoscopic versus a microscopic discectomy. Um, so uh, that, that would be sort of my, my, my first reaction that yes, the surgeon is sort of the elephant in the room, but that there is a like massive variation at the level of surgeon choice. And and just to be clear, you know, um, in terms of indications for surgery, uh, this was not kind of a randomized trial, right? Because there definitely are some discs that, uh, you know, as a person who does endoscopy, I say, oh, this is the perfect case for endoscopy, especially transferaminal. Uh, and then some other discs, as you know, you know, uh, I'm either using, you know, a biportal technique or interlaminar technique, uh, which I think the microdiscectomy um, does, th does that a little better. And so some of that is lost in, 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 in this paper as well. Would you say yeah. that? Yeah. That's a, uh, thanks for bringing up that point. I, I, that was one reason why I was uh, happy to see that, um, uh, that you would be part of this conversation because uh, you know, even when I was doing this analysis, you know, the, the way this worked out is that there was there's two there were two surgeons at Jefferson that were doing uh, endoscopic discectomies and everyone else was doing microscopic. So that alone is a potential bias, right? Is it just that the, the two endoscopic surgeons are you know more or less expensive or what have you? And then the second point which you brought up is the types of cases that are amenable to a transframinal endoscopic discectomy are are a, a subset of the kind of surgeries that otherwise would be done microscopically. And so um, that's a really important point. We did, one of the covariates that we uh, attempted to adjust for was the location of the disc herniation. And so these are all lumbar. And so our hope there was to say, okay, endoscopic discectomies are traditionally more often done perhaps for foraminal lateral recess or perhaps upper lumbar where the, the advantage of, of being transforaminal is, is more so than sort of a inner laminar microscopic approach. So. That was our attempt to sort of uh, um, uh, appreciate that potential confounder, um, but it's still retrospective. And so there's only so much you can do there. Uh, and to your point, a true prospective, potentially randomized 
study would be the only way to sort of definitively address like those kinds of confounders. Can you? Uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Yeah. Can you uh, um, elaborate a little more on? I guess one of the takeaways I got was that essentially there was once you controlled for surgeon, uh, there ended up being like no difference. And can you talk a little bit more about what you mean mechanistically in the in the statistics by controlling for surgeon when you had it sounds like you had some two surgeons doing exclusively endoscopic, the other five did exclusively microscopic. Uh, you know, so thanks for the question. So uh, all two surgeons. Um, did both microscopic and endoscopic and all the other surgeons only did microscopic. Got it. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's, that, that's an important uh, point to bring up. And in terms of the, the mechanics of the analysis, initially we did a multiple regression analysis where we included sort of a priori certain confounders that we knew would be, you know, potential uh, influences on, total cost, whether it's a BMI or a whole, a whole host of variables. Um, but then we, when we, when we did that, we was like, well, hold on. You know, these two surgeons are, you know, you are the only ones doing the endoscopic cohort. So we have to, we have to adjust for that as well. And when we did a second analysis, adjusting for that initial, that additional surgeon covariate, then the difference in cost that we had initially seen went away. Um, and, uh, you know, when we looked at the data, just in a descriptive uh, sense, it matched our intuition, which is that the supply costs looked to be higher, just in terms of a raw head to head comparison between the two cohorts, which at least at, at Jefferson made sense based on the types of drapes and the, the radio frequency probe and other things adding up um, uh, versus sort of a, a microscopic standard case. Um, uh, but then that that statistical difference uh, fell away after we adjusted for that final surgeon covariate. Yeah, that uh, another thing is that you you didn't mention which endoscopic setup you have. You just said there was 185k, but it has an R an RF probe. Is that like for nav? Oh uh, yeah, so so the 185k is for that was our estimate for what the initial purchase order uh, involved to get. The, and the the you know two sets of endoscopes to get the endoscopic tower all the sort of the, the one time expenses to be able to start the endoscopic program that's where that large figure comes from um, but the per case costs like the RF probe is essentially the endoscopic bipolar or bovi if you will um, right. and then even the drill uh, if you end up using like the diamond burr uh, that's a per case disposable cost and and there are drapes and and so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, uh, I hope that helps clarify. Um, and so the, re the reason we we put the figure of like the hundred, uh, you know, hundred eighty five thousand or whatnot in the discussion was to say, hey, look, what we don't want people to assume from this paper is that if you're deciding whether to start an endoscopic program or a you know more traditional microscopic program, hey, the costs are all the same. Uh, we're talking about that marginal next case, assuming you've already purchase the sort of initial capital equipment that you need to do either. Yeah. Yeah. I think Wait, that's a, that go ahead. I think that's a good, good point. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, you know, the upfront cost is, is a little bit different for everybody. Right. So if you are at a ASC that hasn't opened yet, right. Then 185,000 actually could be much cheaper than buying a microscope. Yes. Right. right. Uh, and traditionally, you know, uh, a lot of these surgeries were done in big hospitals where there already is a microscope. Um, and so the argument sometimes is, well, we already have the microscope. Why are we going to pay an extra 185? But now if you're moving into a new environment, and I think we're all seeing this, uh, I think actually, um, if I'm correct, that you know, a recent uh, journal uh, cover of neurosurgery was neurosurgery at the ASC you know, whether it's functional neurosurgery, whether it's spine and so on. And so now that you want to move into these in different environments, right, the 185 is actually cheaper than buying a microscope, which isn't at all ASC. So I think that's a that's an important point that's not touched upon here. And uh, I think that as we see more and more uh, of us going into ASCs, um, that's going to be uh, very relevant. I think it's a, that's a, that's a great point, Mohamed. Uh, you know, I, 
what it, you know, we don't really learn the business of medicine when we're going through training and then suddenly we're dealing with it every day, especially when we're trying to innovate or bring something new to a program. And uh, I, I had a big aha moment when I realized that, okay, from the hospital standpoint, whether it's inpatient or at an ASC, they're getting paid based off of a facility fee that comes from a DRG. And, and that diagnosis related code may just be for a, you know, lumbar discectomy, right? And if they've already, like to your point, made all the capital expenses up front for cranial nerve surgery and for everything else to have a microscope and this and that, um, you know, it, it, it's a hard sell to, 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 to pitch to a hospital to say, I want you to now buy this upfront one-time capital expense and it's gonna be more expensive per case uh, and now your margins are going down and they're going to say, well, wait a minute, we've been doing these cases all along and, and now you're saying you want to do it this way and we're going to make less on it or maybe even lose money. And so um, it's it's in in the spirit of that conundrum. That I said, OK, well, the capital expense is one thing. Like you said, every situation is different. You know, let's put that aside. Let's at least tackle the question of the marginal cost per case. Um, and see if you know uh, we can make some make some progress there. And so, if you are at that ASC, and your business operations leader is saying, "Look, like yeah, the microscope is more expensive than the endoscope, but when it comes to the the volume game, you know, however many discectomies we're going to be doing a year in this ASC, we'd much rather have this higher margin on a microscopic discectomy than the lower margin on an endoscopic one." And it was that sort of criticism that I wanted to sort of test. Um, uh, with, with this sort of, uh, and this is obviously retrospective. It's a specific institution. It was Jefferson. And I should also say it's two surgeons that, you know, uh, we all have different uh, sort of uh, levels of skill and comfort uh, when it comes to these kind of procedures, especially the newer ones. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, just starting my fourth year in practice. So a, a transframal endoscopic discectomy done by Muhammad and one done by myself may have a different outcome profile and different cost profile. So all that needs to be taken into an account. Um, so, I, so I don't necessarily want to make the claim in this paper that we are now declaring on a stone tablet that in Microsoft discectomies, the marginal cost is identical uh, across the board. It's more about saying, here's a methodology that uh, is, is powerful for trying to answer these kinds of questions. We've applied this methodology in this context and um, hopefully it can spur a more prospective randomized study to really try and answer the question definitively. Do you mind if I uh, chime in? It, my question's a little bit different. So as I was reading the introduction, you mentioned something that kind of, something that I face with uh, lit, for example, for tumors or radiation necrosis. But do you find any issues with pay, right? Like, in other words, is there reimbursement for this all across the board? Like, or do you find that some people are saying, oh, wait, endoscopic is too experimental or too new, and we're not going to cover it, and we're going to do something different? And is this paper part like, well, here it's not different, and therefore you can look at this and say, hey, you know, it's kind of the same, you should be able to reimburse, it's not more, like, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, um, I can take a quick stab at it, but I'm curious what James and Muhammad's uh, uh, experience has been. Uh, when I was in Philadelphia, there were plenty of times when um, a private pair would deny um, uh, deny an endoscopic discectomy because um, it was on their experimental list. Um, and I would try and, you know, naive me would try and send them, send them papers ahead of time before the peer appear. They're not reading any of that. They don't care. You know, it's on the experimental list. So it's on the experimental list. Right. Um, and so I definitely faced that. Um, in, even in terms of the professional fees, uh, not that that's what matters at all, but, um, at a lot of health systems, the, um, the formal code, the CPT code for a transframinal endoscopic discectomy is, is, a, is technically an unlisted code, which means it, it, it doesn't automatically have an RVU, uh, a total assigned to it. So unless you have gone to your health system, if you're an employed surgeon and said, Hey, FYI, we're going to be doing these procedures and you have to essentially get a proxy code like 63030 for a traditional, you know, hemilaminotomy, microdiscectomy, and have them give you quote unquote credit for that uh, because um, because the the uh, I think it's 62380 that the endoscopic discectomy code is unlisted. Um, so there's it's almost like the system is conspiring on multiple angles to get you to not do this sort of thing. 
both in terms of the denial up front and then, you know, making it hard to get reimbursed as a surgeon. Um, and so I, you know, uh, it, that's definitely, that's definitely frustrating. Um, and, uh, I think that's, that's why we need to be doing publishing more and, and, uh, and sort of uh, attacking this from all angles, but, uh, but love to hear what everyone else thinks. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. I'm dealing with that as we speak, you know, um, and, you know, as a person who, um, you know, I look at things, I think, you know, pretty fairly, there definitely are some cases where, I don't think that the traditional way is the best way. I think that the endoscopic way is the best way. And it's those cases that really, you know, hit, a, a strike a chord in you because you're like, I don't want to do it this way because if it was my family member, it was me. I, I firmly believe that, you know, this, you know, endoscopic way is the best way. Uh, when it's, you know, there's some type of, you know, uh, equipoise, you know, I could see that, you know, the insurance companies and so on. But it, it really is a difficult when there's a situation where, in my mind, there's no equipoise. Uh, and uh, um, I think that, you know, as Dr. Vega said, you know, the parallels are, 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 are similar in all types of new kind of uh, technologies or new types of procedures. Yeah. The other quick point I would make is that, um, in my mind, this type of cost analysis is actually uh, the least interesting type of cost question you could ask around endoscopy. Like the, the other questions I would like to ask are, for example, what if we look at the entire surgical episode cost, not just the intra-op cost? A patient undergoing a almost nearly percutaneous transframal endoscopic discectomy, maybe they're leaving the PACU in 30 minutes versus a microscopic discectomy leaving in two and a half hours. Uh, might not seem like a big deal from our standpoint because they're both outpatient, but when you get down to personnel, man hours and, and in the PACU and all of that, and um, uh, and how, how many cases you can do in a day in an ASC, I think those kind of differences will matter. Uh, and then the big one is, and I think Muhammad was, you were alluding to this a little bit, is that there are some cases or some patients where the choice is between an endoscopic discectomy and a fusion. Right, like we all have those patients where maybe they had a previous uh, MIS or open lumbar decompression or discectomy, say it's in the upper lumbar spine and they've had a recurrent disc herniation, say at L2-3 or L1-2. And if you were to approach that problem through an interlaminar approach, even endoscopic or, or, or tubular or open, you're probably subjecting that patient to a fusion because you're gonna have to take down too much of the joint or what have you. Whereas with a transframinal endoscopic approach, you can you can potentially attack that problem and, so, and solve the problem at least for for some time without doing a fusion. And the if you were to play that movie forward, sort of the projected total cost over the next twenty years of care for that patient, um, if they get a fusion versus uh, an endoscopic disectomy, that's a that's a dramatic difference. Uh, and if you're a payer, I would think you'd really care about that, you know, because you'd want to try to limit the amount of fusions. And sometimes, sometimes an endoscopic disectomy can do that or at least postpone it. Um, and yet that type of thinking doesn't seem to get any sort of traction right now. Um, so that's what I would love to do uh, in the near future is to say, is to take a set of patients to Muhammad's point that have equipoise where you, maybe you can avoid a fusion with an endoscopic approach or otherwise you do a fusion and you follow those patients for say five years. And you see what's the total healthcare spend for those patients through either sort of trajectory they went down. That's, I think, a really interesting cost analysis, much more so than sort of this sort of uh, slicing and dicing in the operating room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a really good start. And I really <laughs> enjoyed, you know, obviously this work and hopefully it inspires others that are listening. So, Did uh, in the course of doing a study and looking back and talking to each of the, the surgeons involved, um, did any way this changed practice there at, at Jefferson or in your practice, things you trimmed out or? Yeah, um, thanks, for, thanks for the question. Yeah, we actually, it sort of allowed us a little bit of introspection. So both my and my partner, Dr. Jack Jallo, um, who I should have mentioned his name earlier, um, are the, were the two surgeons that did the endoscopic discectomies. And Dr. Jallo is the one that started the program, the endoscopic program. And, and I have him to thank for even having the opportunity to, to do these cases at Jefferson. Um, but we started saying, let's actually dig into the supply cost totals that are being tracked for our cases. And we started saying, well, you know what, you're opening uh, these reamers, the foraminal crown reamers, uh, uh, every case, but there's only a certain subset of cases where 
I know I actually want to use the crown reamer, um, or maybe I'm not even going to use the drill on this case. Um, and so that was a change that that came within sort of the endoscopic side to sort of see if we could get more lean because we weren't really, to be honest, weren't even really thinking about that. Just open the endoscopic stuff is sort of like the the way we were thinking about it. And so we got a little more sort of uh, patient specific about it. Um, uh, and um, on the on the microscopic side, I don't think it, that there was as much of a. It's not like somebody said, "Hey, I'm going to start doing endoscopic discectomies alone just because of this." Obviously, um, but I think it made us a little more lean. Yeah, that brings uh, one question I wanted to ask was, you know, you know, the endoscopy uh, technology is newer. Uh, and so whenever you have new technology, you know, there is kind of a exaggerated cost, you know, all of us pay, you know, whatever we used to pay for the, our big screen TVs. And now the big screen TVs yeah. are, are much cheaper. Um, how much of that do you think? Is there is there some wiggle room in there? Or are we kind of at our our, our limits? Yeah, that's a that's a, a great uh, question, Muhammad. I, I mean, I think to be honest, I think you you may represent one of the surgeons who is doing something interesting in this space. You know, to be honest, around you know biportal, um, and uh, which we haven't really mentioned here is that um, people that are new to endoscopy might assume that like all spinal endoscopy is sort of you can put it into one bucket, um, but both in terms of the technique, uh, the equipment that you use, and the cost profile, there are big differences even within the spinal endoscopy space. And I know you do a fair amount of uh, biportal endoscopy as well, or UBE as it's called internationally. And one of the, uh, and you can speak to this much more than me, but one of the advantages of that amongst others is this notion that you can use sort of a standard shoulder endoscope and you can use your traditional spine instruments that are even, that we're using for open cases. And that should in theory dramatically reduce like that marginal cost per case for a biportal interlaminar endoscopic case. Um, and so I think that is going to put some cost pressure on the uniportal companies. If they start seeing that a surgeon just wants to be able to check the endoscopic box and they're happy to go down the biportal route and that surgeon might have otherwise talked to one of the uniportal companies, but now they're, they're, they're happy. Um, and they feel like they're losing some volume that way, maybe that will apply some cost pressure and some of the capital expense. That's just a friendly nudge to the, uh, to the uniportal companies. Um, but uh, um, I, I, think, I, I think it's a great point. It's not fair to analyze these things in a snapshot in time early in the evolution of a technology, you know, um, uh, just like it was with smartphones or anything else. Awesome. Well, I think that kind of, uh, starts to wrap things up. Any any other comments? No, I think this was great. Yeah, thank you, Siva. Yeah, Th thanks to you all for for your time on a on a on an evening today. Thank you guys so much. All right. Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining and taking the time. And um, wanted to also mention that this uh, CNS podcast activity is available to, to claim one point five CMEs by visiting the podcast page at cns.org. And uh, join us next month for the next episode. Thank you all. Thank you.